It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, baby! And today, we are doing writing songs for film, TV, and ads versus writing songs for radio and records with none other than Mr. John Pearson! Yeah! <laughs> Howdy! Hey, JP, how are you, man? I am doing great, Mr. Lasco. I'll great. Get the pronunciation correct this time. <laughs> That's all right. Don't worry about it. Believe me, I've I've had I've been called Lascow more times than Lasco. And of course in grade school I was there goes the last cow under the fence. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, cow. Doesn't face me. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, John is uh has been a member of gosh, how many years? Uh, I don't even remember now. It's like seven or August twenty fifth. Yeah, August 2015. Uh, August 2015 was when I joined. All right. So, uh, and we're going to talk about writing songs for film, TV, and ads today versus radio and records. And I say radio and records. Obviously, now it's not so much radio and so much records as it is playlists on Spotify and other streaming services, obviously. Um but I'm old school, so I still call it radio and records. But there is a difference uh, between writing those. And John is a really good guy to talk about this stuff because he lives in Nash Vegas. I mean Nashville. And uh, he, you know, has, has played bass. Well, here, uh, he played. He's a Grammy-winning bass player who's played with and toured with John Barry, Dina Carter, Susie Boggess, Billy Dean, Mel McDaniel, many others. Isn't there a Reba in there somewhere? Don't I remember that you toured with Reba? We we opened up for her for a year doing uh, the, doing the arenas. Yeah, wow, that was that was what is, awesome. What is That's, that like standing on a stage looking out at twenty thousand, thirty thousand people? I mean, yeah, it was every show was sold out because it was Reba, um, and we were the opener, of course, and it was just pandemonium from the time you walked out there it was just screaming and it's like this is awesome and the green room was awesome the dressing rooms and reba's people are are the are the best they're, they're the gold standard the whole crew and uh the band just awesome people it was fun um i, I met her for a minute one time uh, she had that building with the studio on the top floor somewhere yep. in that building that the round building if i remember correctly right somewhere on yeah. the row and universal uh or yeah, universal it, uh, building i think or yeah I, I don't know all i know is that she, you could tell literally in the like oh hi nice to meet you moment that i had with her that she was a class act and a gracious lady and just you know it's from the top down that's why all her people were awesome because she was probably awesome to them awesome yeah exactly it's exactly um Wow, I can't even imagine. Uh, I think that's every musician's secret little dream is whether they're the opening act or the star of the, of the main act, whatever, just to stand on a stage and play for that many people. Uh, did you have like sweaty palms and weak knees the first time you did it? <laughs> Not really, because I mean, I, I mean, I've played for 50, 75,000 people at some of these outdoor um, venues, which are a blast, but I get weak kneed and sweaty palms when I'm playing for three or four people or like 15 or 20 or a hundred wow. at the Bluebird cafe doing that's that, those are the things that scare the crap out of me. Really? You know, give me, give me 20,000, 30,000 people. And it's fun. Um, I, I don't know why that I'm sure there's, there's a reason for that, but it, to me, it's that's, that's my, L, I love playing in that element. Oh, that's got. Yeah, yeah. I will forever be jealous of you for that. Um, just you know, not many people can say in their lifetime that they stood in front of an audience that size. So, check yeah, that one off fun. your bucket list. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and you've lived in Nashville and been part of that community, which is a real community for a very long time. And um, and a songwriter as well. So as I remember, you, you know, you were writing with people, doing what Nashvilleians do, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, so so I was playing bass for John Barry, and we had a number one song um, called, I think it was Changed My Mind. Jason Bloom was a co-writer on that, and so was a guy named A.J. Masters. And so I was at the 
the the number one party, um, the, which the label threw to you know denote that. And uh, so I, I bumped into AJ, and so we got to talking. And I said, "Yeah, I, I write some stuff," and um, I gave him a tape. They had tapes back then, <laughs> um, and he actually took it home and listened to it. And he called me and said, "Yeah, man, let's let's get together." So I mean, he had a yeah, he, he wrote a song for Randy Travis, Faith Hill. Um, you know, he's 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 legit. He's an EMI writer, and so we we wrote maybe half a dozen. Um, so that was yeah. I, I got him. I wrote it with a couple of uh, um, Mark Allen Springer, who's gosh, Tanya Tucker, Kenny Chesney. I, I wrote some stuff with him, but nothing really that made it on the radio. But it's yeah, that's the well, way it is. So, what would, what caused you to join Taxi, and what was? The, let's address that part first, and then we'll get into why you decided to go after writing for film and television versus radio and records. Yeah. So, uh, oh gosh, that, that's that's. So as I'm I'm transitioning out of I, I had sold. Let me back up. I, I, I'd um, been a bass player, got married, had children, and got off the road, started my own company, and I ended up selling that company. And I'd waited all this time to get back into music. Um, and this is 2015. And it's like, you know, I'm not going to write for artists because mostly it's it's a young, a very much younger crowd that is that is songwriting with artists and a lot of them are connected somehow with the artist either their friends that came up with the artist or their um, some of the musicians and I didn't have those connections anymore and so I was looking around on on the internet and I I, I saw taxi and I researched it it's like hmm this this looks interesting and um, I liked the I liked what taxi offered I didn't know a whole lot about it at the moment at that moment but I, I loved what the what the offer was and so i checked it out and started submitting songs and went to the road rally in 2015 and that changed my life it wow really did uh, we yeah. hear that from a lot of people what what about it was life-changing just the fact that you took this new direction that you hadn't even thought about uh it, that started I me mean, i was still trying to do the artist thing it um not the artist thing, but writing for artists a little bit. But that road rally, first of all, I'm getting goosebumps. Just go when you go into the the West End and you see all the like minded people. I mean, it was it's like coming home to your home, your family of two thousand people. Right. But it, it it's just such a such an awesome vibe. And then the classes and and the breakdowns of of songs, which I never I wrote. You know, wrote from the heart, of course, and I didn't have a lot of training except for, um, um, I didn't have a lot of training. Let's put it that way. I I listened to what was on the radio at that time and tried to write it. But uh, listening to Robin Frederick and and a lot of the other different people, Jim Crepain, Jason Bloom, um, just talking about this, just t tearing each song apart and just breaking it down to what makes it a song. Um, it just blew me away. And then seeing the difference between writing for artists and, and the, what I transitioned into, because it was just, it looked so much more fun. Because I like to write different styles. Yeah. So, and that's, that's kind of what got me away from writing for artists because I, I just wanted to write different styles. Well, you certainly do that. And I should mention, you've got over 300 songs signed at this point. Now, it's it's one thing to write a bunch of 90-second instrumental cues that depending on, you know, if it's orchestral, it takes a long time to do it. If it's like a simple little dramedy thing with a clavinet and pitsy strings or something, not so hard. But songs, songs are tough because you got to write a lyric uh, and you've got to get a vocal done and probably add some background vocals and the mixes are more difficult. So quite an accomplishment that you've got over 300 songs signed with 21 different publishers and music libraries. You've had re uh, some recent national ad placements include commercial with FedEx, another one with Cricket Wireless, 
TV placements in Legacies on The CW, um, Diary of a Future President on Disney, The Rookie on ABC, Outer Banks on Netflix, and a bunch of stuff going on in Europe and Japan. So uh, clearly you, you've figured out the program, you know, and, and I remember it was a, I will forever, please don't get upset with this, but I will forever remember you called me or sent me an email. You were really frustrated once. And I always bring this up and you have to remind me what it was. I know. But, but you shouldn't, you know, it didn't bother me because we really like hearing when members have a problem because if there's something wrong with the system or the particular screener, we do want to know that stuff. And you were not a jerk about it at all. You were almost a little bit hat in hand about it. I could hear the frustration in your voice, but you were being a gentleman, which counts a lot. And um, and I think my advice to you was be patient it'll come, you know, whatever my advice was, it wasn't long after that, that like the first thing happened. And then three weeks later, the next thing happened. So can you tell people kind of the trajectory of when stuff started like happening and you went, oh, I think I've got it dialed in now. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be honest. I'll, I don't think I'll ever have it dialed in. I don't think anybody does. It, cause, I mean, we're, we're trying to hit a moving target and yeah. we're doing the best we can. And, and it's kind of like when you're writing for an artist, you're, if you're writing what's on the radio, you're already a year behind. And it's, it's, it's kind of like the same way with, with film TV, which is one of the reasons why I don't like to write to what's on TV right now. I try to write to what's streaming, what's popular on the charts, because that'll eventually move over to TV. But anyway, um, to get to your, your question, um, so 2015 is when I joined Taxi, and I submitted a lot. And I, I, I took everything to heart, and I took everything personally. It, that's just <laughs> that's the way I am. It's, I'm not going to apologize for it. I get mad at, at, at a screener that, that doesn't like my song. And it's like, then I... Then I cool down and try to figure out why they didn't like it for the opportunity and uh, so it's that was 2015 2016 i got logic in 2016 not this type but the one that you <laughs> anyway um so i got that in january and and just just i mean i would shed it big time and tried to figure that out and I got a little bit better and a little bit better. And it was 2017 before I actually signed my, let's see. I got one song signed November, December of 2016. And then I signed my first vocal collection in 2017. And that's actually one of the songs, two songs off that were used in those commercials, FedEx and Cricket, wow. um, off my first collection. So, um, and I stuck to what I knew. I, I didn't have a lot of sounds. Um, so organic stuff. So I, I can play guitar. I can play bass. Um, picked up a ukulele and learned to play that. And that's what that whole album was pretty much based on. Of course, with Logic sounds that were stock in the, in the DAW. So. But that's kind of when the lights started coming on sometime in, in 2017 figuring it out so about a year and a half and so if whoops you're frozen there if i lose you just remember uh -oh. to uh, yep yeah you know what to do so far i haven't <laughs> lost you but you know the drill if i do um all right so i'm gonna play john sent me three songs that i'm gonna play today and the first one uh why don't you do the setup on it because you'll do it better than i will yeah so this is actually the first song I had signed and signed to a non-exclusive library that a lot of us know that are taxi family. Um, and I was surprised it got signed um, because it, it's not your typical film TV. Um, I wrote this when I was coming off of a, my mom passed away in 2016 and I, I well, dealing with the, those emotions and I was trying to channel them into a productive way and this is not a true story by any <laughs> by 
by any stretch. So, but it's just using those emotions. And if you listen to this song, um, you'll be able to see there's a whole lot of furniture, which songwriters call furniture. It's it's basically you're describing in minute detail um, what is in the scene because you're you're not expecting. Well, it, for film, well, we'll get into that later. But you'll 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 get the idea of what furniture is when you hear all the descriptive um, things talked about, especially in this first verse. All right, that, let's. That yeah, that's good. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, it is. I, I, I've honestly I've heard it called furniture a thousand times. I call it uh, visual details. You know, uh, stuff you would yeah. see in the room if you were walking into it. And country music especially has tons of visual details in it, which makes country really hard to use in the world of sync because those visual details are already done by a set designer. So a Tiffany lamp in your song and walking into a modern bedroom in the scene, not going to work. Anyway, let's have a listen. This is Dead Man's Chair. Mm -hmm. There's a bottle on the table and an empty next to it Shot glass filled with ashes and one cigarette unlit There's a smell of spent gunpowder and perfume in the air And the wail of sirens coming I'm sitting in a dead man's chair Whoa, sitting in a dead man's chair There's a body in the bedroom With a woman by his side She used to be my sunshine Until I followed her tonight now her life is on my fingers In my eyes a bloodshot stare The siren's getting closer I'm sitting in a dead man's chair Whoa, sitting in a dead man's chair Tomorrow's for an angry moment's rage But the fire is growing colder While the consequence remains There's headlights on the windows And I know I should feel scared With a pistol cock but empty I'm sitting in a dead man's chair Whoa, sitting in a dead man's chair I'm sitting in a dead man's chair <laughs> What a happy song. <laughs> oh, man, it, it, they don't make them much happier than that. Woo. Uh, but it's really well crafted, and it tells a story. And you're right, the furniture's all over that room. <laughs> Bloodstained and all. And <laughs> yeah, right. Call an NCIS. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> you could definitely... Um, I, I can see, you know, although a lot of publishers would be afraid to sign that, there are sections of it that could easily be used. So um, I, I can see why it got signed, even though most people would say, ah, too much furniture for film and TV. There's a lot of detail in there. Mm, way too much. Yeah, it, it's been pitched twice. And I think 
the first time just because they were going for Ray w Wiley Hubbard kind of sound alike. And I, I wasn't aware of who Ray Wiley Hubbard was and I had to look him up. It's like, oh, cool. But um, I think the second, the other pitches have been just the, the backing track. So, so I was just right. using a, a bottleneck slide on, on my acoustic. And so. Well, and you know what? I, I didn't even write that question, but let's talk about that because I hear that from a, a lot of our members that they craft songs and then uh, they submit a, an alt mix or a mix minus vocal. And they're always a little bummed out. <laughs> Bev Niven says, was it for an ad? Yeah, it was for um, a Smith & Wesson ad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh sorry bev <laughs> i couldn't resist anyway um yeah the members are bummed out they put so much effort into writing the lyric and getting a great vocal on it and then whoever licenses the track ends up using the instrumental version and maybe just the line sitting in a dead man's chair which that could make it into a lot of tv shows that have a suicide in there um yeah they could and there's no shortage of them sadly so I could see how that would work, but um, have you ever had that before? Uh, or, or I should say, have you noticed a pattern that oftentimes when your stuff does get used that they end up using more of the instrumental stuff and less of the lyric or not so much? Yeah, it's. I think I'm running about 50-50 right now. But the thing is, the, the vocal and the lyrics will, are gonna catch the, 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 the supervisor or the editor, they're gonna catch the ear and if you're just sending an instrumental track, it, it may not. So if you have a top-notch vocalist on there and you've crafted the lyrics really well, and you've got a cool hook, which is normally the title, um, that could catch them and just make them consider your song. But yeah, so um, I had a song used by, there's a company called Raymore and Flanagan that is a, a big furniture company in the Northeast. And they licensed one of my songs. It's called, um, Feel at home, yeah. Feel at home, and I, I, it's a three and a half minute song. I mean, I've got I don't know seventy five tracks and all these backing vocals and um, arpeggiators going. It's it's really a cool cool song to me. And so they call we do a Zoom with me and the publisher, and he goes, "Can you give me a ukulele track just with the hook? Feels like home." <laughs> so, all the instrumentation and they needed it uh, we don't need it right away you, you have till 2 p.m this afternoon this is like <laughs> nine o'clock so like, okay that's a great so, story yeah, threw it down and it's like no effects whatsoever on the vocal or the ukulele and i mean it's i always just look i looked at it online it's just now it's, it's got 10 million views so it's wow it's still up there and running so it um it's and they did actually use for another commercial they did use the full version but they only used the hook feels like home but you know that's one of the hallmarks of great advertising music is a simple big yet simple phrase that's easy to digest and eminently memorable and something that you associate with i mean now that you told i've never heard of that furniture chain but now that you told me that makes perfect sense feels like home that's why you go out and buy all that stuff you put in your home so you want it to feel like your home yeah and, and what and that was part of that collection that i did back in 2017 and you know the publisher was trying to steer me because that was my first trying to steer me um and he just he said try to think of what the song might be used for and kind of in the back of my mind i was thinking of a hotel chain or or real estate but also, I'm I'm always thinking, you know, it's the song's got to make sense personally, and it's I'm not writing about a hotel or real estate. I'm writing about someone making you feel a, an actual person making you feel at home. So there has to be that connection. But yeah, it's I was surprised that, that it went for furniture. But yeah, it, once I saw, it, it's like, oh yeah, I can see this. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Um, I'm going to play Living in the Simulation, and up oh, there it is. And this one you wrote for film and TV, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and this was just signed actually two weeks ago, and it's a little more up-tempo than the last one. 
So all right, <laughs> start with the dirge. <laughs> All right. Well, the publisher should send us a thank you note after the episode hits YouTube because they'll make a whopping 14 cents on this. Here we go. This part is great. So people keep asking in the chat room, is that you singing on the last one and or this one? No, no. You don't want to hear me singing. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe uh, at one of the open mics at the rally, I'll, I'll, I'll get up and do a song. But yeah, it's. Um, I think I've only sang three songs that have been signed. Uh, and especially, I, I was going for, a. Um, there's a band called Death Cab for Cutie. And right. that's kind of what I modeled that, that song after. And it's specifically, I looked a, hard, a long time. Air Gigs is, is where I, I found that vocalist. Um, Air Gigs. Yeah, let's plug. You know what? I want to plug them because they were a sponsor of the Road Rally because you introduced me to them. And I really deeply appreciate that because the owner of Air Gigs and I, it's like we could have been brothers from the same family. We, we run our companies with the same ethic. And you mentioned that when you called me, you said, you'll like this guy. He runs his company like you run taxi. And we instantly hit it off. And I think what they're doing is great. Just so you guys, uh, for those of you who don't know, airgigs.com. Um, it's a place where you can find talent or you can get found as talent. Um, and it's just well run. The website really is laid out well. Everything about it is good. I think John is frozen. Uh oh. Yep. Yeah. Just keep talking. You'll come back. All right. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Air Gigs is where you got uh, your vocalist. Um, yeah, and he and it's funny. He's actually a Nashville guy, um, but I didn't know that. 
and I've I've ended up using a couple people. Uh oh, let me make sure. Can you hear me still? Yeah, but your picture is starting to pixelate. I'm guessing the family got home and turned on Netflix. I'm I'm making Tech- sure that they're. <laughs> Get out of my house, kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, can you hear? Wow, I look very multicolored. And yeah, now you're starting to get garbled. Well, if all else fails and this doesn't clear up in a minute or two, I'll just call you on the phone and put the phone up to the microphone. We'll do it that way. But hopefully we can keep <laughs> you up there. And they must have gotten your yeah. text because all of a sudden now it's just fine. I see that. But, yeah, to reiterate, <laughs> Michael, um, yeah, air gigs. I've, I've, I used to use another service before air gigs, and I had an issue, and they were not helpful whatsoever. Air Gigs has the best customer service. And I, I've, I've used vocalists, hired vocalists, and it didn't work out. And they, ha- they have an option on there where you can actually cancel the gig. Um, and I usually will pay the vocalist something, but sometimes they'll change the key of your song and not tell you. I had that happen one time, and it's like, dude, you can't do that. It's uh, no. anyway, but. <laughs> And David with uh, with Air Gigs, um, very very good customer service and helped me out. And that was very few problems. And I've problems with Air Gigs, and, and I've done I looked today three hundred and forty six different jobs on Air Gigs, um, using different people. Wow, so, yeah, they're, they're they're fantastic. So, well, I'm, but I'm yeah, hap- it's, it's not me singing. <laughs> I played everything else. Um, and, and people commented about the drums. And I remember that you're a big fan of, of Logic Drummer, which is the like the in-house drummer that comes with Logic. Is that what you used on that track? Yeah. So the the first one that was just Easy Drummer, where I because it was so simple. And but no, this one, this was uh, this is Logic's in-house in-daw drummer, and um, it's I think it's the alternative alternative rock version and of course you can go in there and you can dial dial fills back you can change it from hi-hat to ride cymbal um to just it it's a it's a great thing and um i i thought long and hard before choosing logic as my daw and um that was one of the reasons why i chose it because of that 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 um that algorithm that it's just i love it you know what can i say Sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, this brings up an interesting point. Uh, on a recent episode, we were talking about making things sound modern, and I was reading an email that we'd gotten from a taxi member who was upset with us because the screener said, um, your stuff, your sounds in particular, I think, don't sound all that modern. And, and the guy's like, hey, dude, I just bought the most recent, most up-to-date Stephen Slate drums. And, you know, how can it not sound modern? It was, my money would be on the way he played them sounded very dated, like 70s or 80s drums, because that's probably the generation that that of music that that person grew up with. So they programmed the drums to emulate that, and it made them sound old. You know, we're trained to know, oh, that's like a, as I said on the show, tucka 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 tuck. That's a very seventies yeah. turnaround, you know. Yeah, and and you can actually go into Logic and you can listen to. They have different drummers. You can go into a sixties style, and it'll play sixties style fills, but you know, um, not writing those. So I'm going to whatever the most current thing is. And yeah, you can have the the. It's like um, if, if you've got a melody and you're playing you're using the the most up to date contact instrument or or atmosphere or something like that, but you're playing a melody that um, just sounds like it's from the '60s or '70s or whatever, um, it it defeats the purpose of having all the up to date sounds to me. And it's like you said with drums, it's you hi-hat especially hearing the way hi-hat is used 
um, well, especially in hip hop, um, yeah. R and B. Um, but it's, and that's been kind of static for, for, for a number of years that the 808 type of hi hat, but um, it has little, you know, variations. But yeah, uh, drums. It, it's having great sounds is part of it, and then listening to what's being played on hit records, figuring out what they're doing, and always less is more. If instead of throwing in some possibly old sounding fill don't even put it in there sometimes symbols you don't even want symbols in there because they're yeah. going to clash with one thing with with dialogue um or you have to dial them back the symbols way down so they're not clashing but yeah things like well, that. well let's talk about those elements that you've learned about i i know you pretty well and i know that you're very you're research heavy, you're anal, you're particular, you're, you're all, which is all good stuff for doing this. I mean, you can't look at it and go, well, this is the way it's done right. But, you know, that's not what I like. I don't have that skill or I don't feel like investing the time. You will absolutely invest the time to nail that style. So, um, and, you know, you're not 24 years old, I'm guessing. Um, I, you don't have to tell me how old you are, but, you know, so it's you've had... Huh? 26. <laughs> 26. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you've had to go research this stuff because it sounds like um, indie pop is kind of your thing now, or at least a, a fair amount of what you're doing is like indie pop or indie pop rock. So how how do you learn about the structure, the melody, the rhythm, the mood, the tempo? Can we can we go down that list and, and talk briefly about each one of those? Like um, a struck, do you structure a film and TV song like you would structure a song that's supposed to be for an artist or on the radio, or yeah. is it diff? How is it different? It's it's completely different to me because um, listen to what's on what's streaming, what's on the on the charts, or what's on the radio. Um, there's not a whole lot of space in these songs, so you've got lyrics on top of lyrics. I mean, it's, it's like, there's not a lot of space because they don't want to give you a chance to turn the channel or, or skip, you know, right. skip the song. Um, and, and TV film, you gotta have space. I mean, if you gotta leave space, it, I made that mistake often when I started out because my songs, I thought were cool. They sound what's on the radio, but yes, you want to do that, but you gotta leave space for the dialogue that's supposed to be there. Um, so you, you have a phrase, um, I don't know, 10 syllables and then a, a little bit of a space and I got to take this off. I'm getting an echo. Um, but then a little bit of space to, to, to give the editor some, a, a place to bring in the dialogue. And that's, that's one of the main things to me. Um, just being too wordy is... <laughs> is a kiss of death a lot of times i mean let's say you're doing a montage and you know and there's no dialogue whatsoever that's that would be the only difference to, to me anyway so um and how about melody because your stuff has very you know that last song we heard was um a very hip contemporary melody and so do you sit down and study melodies uh, of what's happening musically today and go oh you know that they don't do there's not a lot of range between those notes everything is fairly compact what have you noticed how have you learned it um i'll be completely honest that i do most of that by listening to a lot of music and i don't see i, I grew up with 70s and 80s i was playing 80s rock in in bands in the 80s um <laughs> so um that's one of my favorite types of music but i have not listened to any 70s 80s 90s music in forever i mm -hmm. i can't i listen to what is current right now because as soon as you go listen to older stuff that you like completely i won't say corrupt but i just did it corrupts your mind mindset as far as writing what's current because right now melodies are, are completely different the phrasing, um, Jai Joseph said, um, I guess, ho hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. But um, 
he saw him at the road rally and um, his big thing that I my takeaway was um, the meter or structuring. Um, he does this thing with hand clapping. So you take a song and you know, your chorus is dot, 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 dot. So then your um, your verse has to be something completely different, like da, da, da. It's, mm-hmm. it, I'm not explaining it like Jai, Jai does, but it's making sections completely different melodically, but mostly rhythmically, the, the melodic rhythm is changing that. So I learned that from Jai, of course, but also hearing that um, on current music, but uh, to long way to get to your your answer for melodies it's mostly just listening to lots of melodies and just picking out what they're doing i didn't actually read up on that's one of the few things i i I don't read up on i just pick that up by just listening um do you have to consciously think about it as you're working on a melody do you ever have that moment where you go now i sound like an old dude um, you know what? What would somebody younger do in this situation, and then force yourself to go there and put a smile on your face? I used to, but um, it, it's funny you say that because I, yeah, I used to, and and, and working with co-writers sometimes, uh, somebody will will come up with something, and it, it just sounds um, like it could have worked in the past, and but not right now, and um, yeah, it's after you've done it listen so much to what's out there right now it kind of gets ingrained in you that um that's the way i think right now is 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 in i I hope i like to think i'm thinking in contemporary melodies and um i do my best to to try to emulate them oh that last song was a great example of that you know it had that light breezy um love and life indie pop vibe instantly um, and, and your melody was a great example of that, I thought. So good job. Um, let's talk about moods, how you approach the mood. Um, I, I, I think that most writers, I'm going to venture to say most pro songwriters, they get big cuts, never even think about mood. They think about, can you dance to it? Will it make people feel good? But they don't think about, well, um, I just got a request. You know, you're answering briefs, you're answering taxi listings, where it's looking for a mood of loss, maybe, or it's looking for a mood of, I'm, um, you know, throwing in the towel, or it's looking for a mood of my day couldn't get any better than this one. And, and so, how do you approach? How did you teach yourself to write mood? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, um, I mean, I would literally put myself in, literally, yeah, you got it wrong, but I would put myself <laughs> You must have a in, teenager in the house. <laughs> I, yeah, um, yeah, he's 18. Um, I would literally. put myself in the, sh- in the, sho- <laughs> in the <laughs> shoes of, of a person that, that is having that bad day. I, I, I don't want to be superficial. I want to feel it. Um, um, I was thinking about this this interview, and and I wrote some things down, and one of them was I I, I would go, um, I mean to stores sometimes, but I would watch people in airports is, is great, watch people and try to put yourself into the the shoes of that person, and the interaction they have with the people around them, their family members, maybe a significant other, and I, I would really. I embed myself into that, that try to anyway, put myself into that, that person's shoes and feel what I think they would be feeling. And yeah, it, it, that's to me, that's the best way. And not just, and, and of course, all those feelings, we've all felt them in the past. And I'll revisit times when I've had a similar situation, like when one of the taxi listings has references that, um, it might pertain to something that's happened in my past and I'll, I'll go back to it and I'm able to do that pretty easily now and uh, I'll go back there and try to feel what I was feeling um, so that, that can be <laughs> yeah it, it works I, and so something I've thought about because I put myself in the shoes of our members oftentimes to try and 
understand you guys better to deliver a better service to you. And I think that if I were a writer that I would read a taxi listing or get a brief from a publisher and say, oh, it's this kind of mood. And I would sit down with the absolute intent to write a song with that, that conveys that mood, but it wouldn't take much to get me off course and all of a sudden the song becomes something else. How do you stay on the path to get to the destination that, that you set out to do? That's gotta be hard. Yeah, that is. Um... I don't know. It's I, I guess I, I usually have, I don't know, 10, 15 songs going at the same time. And wow. they, they are all in different, different moods, a lot of them, different genres, too. And I kind of float between one to the other based on and this would be something if you're if you're trying to get started. Now, of course, when you're writing for a listing, and it's got a schedule it's like or a deadline it's this probably wouldn't work but um it's it's nice to have a bunch of songs going that are in different ones so you can capitalize on what you're feeling right now um i mean i'll, I'll look i'll go online and, and look at some news sites and i'll look at the comments section and a lot of times that that's fodder for uh for writing because you're getting people's emotions um sometimes it's anger sometimes it's you know frustration um you can come off of that and kind of channel that into your song but um yeah it's so for me it's 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 picking the mood that matches whatever song i'm working on at the time so i'm not a lot of help there unfortunately <laughs> well i can see what you mean you know yesterday as you know i was in orlando this weekend visiting my grandsons and uh, we went to universal studios for the first half of yesterday and, and i was done everybody else went to the restroom at one point i was sitting outside just watching people for like five or ten minutes and one thought I had was, boy, what a cross-section of America. You know, if you turn on the news, you mostly hear the East Coast and West Coast, uh, the media center take on America. But I, I remember having the thought, look at all these people. All their lives are different. The people from Kansas are different from the people from New Jersey. The people from Oregon are different from the people in the Dakotas, which is not that far from yeah. them. And, and they all watch different types of TV shows and therefore, you know, different music appeals to different demographics, which goes into different TV shows. So there's a lot to think about, a lot to absorb. And it's really hard to ask of creative people, get out of yourself. Don't write what makes you happy, although that can be great advice sometimes when you're creating art. But in this case, you're using your art craft and your art skills to fill orders so you kind of have to think about who am i writing this for and what's the mood and, and yeah yeah what's your motivation uh, i mean that the this that what it, uh, that term from hollywood it, you know the actor asking or actress asking what what's their motivation for a certain scene and for us as songwriters it's what's our motivation you have to find that motivation either it's not in yourself. It can't be pers you can't be a personal song for film TV, but you can right. get the emotion of your uh, that you felt. You can certainly feel off your own emotion if you can go back to it, or the, watch the emotion in in people like the guy that just <laughs> okay. Here's one: the guy that just cut me off coming down the interstate. What's what's the emotion that you felt right then? Yeah, I, I could probably write a song about that. It wouldn't get played on the radio, but <laughs> uh, but it's it's channeling the emotion of um, of what you felt like, the frustration, and it's like why can't we all just get along, kind of thing. But uh, there's there's all kinds of places you can get that emotion, different types of emotion, not just the bad. But yeah, it's all somebody some big songwriter that I was talking to at some point in my career said to me, I read books every night and get ideas for songs from books. I'll see one sentence and I won't steal the sentence, but I nope. will steal the emotion 
or the concept or the idea and then build my own piece of creativity around it. I thought that was great advice. And he said, man, he looked at me like, how many songwriters don't you know? Because we all do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I read I read probably an hour, an hour and a half every night. And it's a lot of it's crime, um, you know, James Patterson stuff or uh, Lee Child's stuff, um, The Reacher. Um, series uh, that's yeah. out um, but yeah and a lot of times I can well it's funny because I just got a contract this morning to, to do 10 songs that are in southern goth type of wow. style and um, it's which if you know southern gothic it's kind of a mixture of country blues and rock and has good and evil playing off against each other and it's like oh wow yeah um, I, I wrote five of them over the weekend before when I was thinking about this contract. Um, and so sometimes it just, yeah, and that was all from reading books and getting those emotions. Um, or, yeah. yeah, to reiterate what, you, what your friend said, yeah, it, read, yeah. read books, definitely. Absolutely. I, I've seen, seen stuff in business books and marketing books that if I were a songwriter would have inspired me to probably write an advertising lyric, you know, something simple and bold and easy to digest. And, and you know, copywriting, writing a subject line for an email is not probably that dissimilar from writing a great lyric for the chorus of a song that would work well in advertising. Yeah, um, that's true. And I know you've had some stuff placed in advertising. Uh, there's a good segue, Michael. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you did you set out to write that stuff specifically for advertising? Have you done any sort of analysis, like what makes a song that would work well um, coming out of a ostensibly coming out of a jukebox in the background of a bar scene versus now I'm going to try and write one now that could work really well for advertising, like it's going to be a great day or something like that. Do you make those distinctions and actually sit down and, and approach a project like that? Or you just write for film and TV and hope that something will work for advertising? No, I will specifically write for advertising. And a lot of that starts with a rhythm. Um, something that's, that's catchy to me. Um, let me back up. A lot of times, my my hooks um, come with uh, with music already in them. So when I when a hook comes to me, it already has music attached. I don't know how that works, but that's a um, blessing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain. But um, <laughs> and then it's, and it's it's all about figuring out if those notes are actually correct. Because sometimes I'll change them or the rhythmic value of, of each of those notes. So. For advertising, a lot of times it's short, short hooks, like "Feels Like Home." It's a thing. It's "Feels Like Home." It's two, two notes, um, <laughs> but it's it's just a simple, something simple and short. Um, the high fields uh, that you had at the rally, gosh, what, what year was that? Twenty nineteen, maybe. Uh, probably twenty nineteen. That sounds about right. Yeah, I'm, I'm big fans of theirs because uh, the stuff that they write is is very hooky, and obviously, I mean, they're very successful. And I remember I usually carry my rig everywhere I go, my laptop and the interface and, and everything. So right after I saw them at the rally, I went back to the hotel room and um, I started writing, and just because I was so inspired. So yeah, it's just. Advertising, uh, it's it's a whole different animal because you're you're writing usually two minute songs to twenty, somewhere in there. And my thing with that is is get the hook, and then try to pronounce that hook in a lot of different ways. Um, I got a song called "I Gotta Have It," and so it's like I gotta have it, I gotta gotta have it. I, I, I say I gotta have it a bunch of different times, but it changes each time. Um, in different sections of the song. That way an editor has different versions of the hook to use 
if they don't like it this way, hey, I got it this way. Right. And that's, and, that's, and they will. They'll they'll keep playing it against picture to see which one melds with the picture the best. That's very smart of you to do that. Yeah, it's and it's to me it's in, it makes it interesting too to listen down to two minute song. And another thing is um this library I work with they asked me to do, they're called catchphrase songs. Mm -hmm. So basically you're taking a catchphrase, a hook, come up with a hook, and then that's all the lyric for the whole song. And then maybe some um, vocalese, uh, non-lyrical, oh, am I freezing again? Mm -hmm. Non-lyrical uh, stuff. And um, and you're, you're doing a two minute song with with just a hook and some non-lyrical O-O-O's or ah uh, right. supporting. Hey, hey, so hey, let's have that. a great day, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm writing that down. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, but those have been licensed, I mean, over and over and over. And um, so they obviously know what they're doing. I don't know where they've been placed, but most of those are in Japan and I have a hard time finding out the usages in in asia for some reason or japan um so anyway well i think you were smart to pay attention to the high fields I, i've literally known them since before they did music for advertising and if i can oh, wow. be incredibly immodest which i'm gonna be i'm sorry but it's it's all the truth they would tell you this um, they're very close friends of Rob Shirelli's. Rob is like a brother to me. And he called me and said, would you mind going out to lunch? Rob loves to go to lunches and, and discuss business stuff. So we went to a, like a, a deli, you know, where you get a ham or a corned beef on rye sandwich kind of deli. And um, Rob said, tell them, they, they were taxi members. They were getting really ticked off that they weren't getting forwarded for some advertising stuff. And, uh, and Rob's like, you know, I don't think it's your screeners. They're not getting it wrong. The high fields need to be better. Tell them everything they need to know to, to figure it out. And I just gave them the name of two or three writers that I knew that were killing it at the time in advertising uh, music and said, just go listen to what they do and ask yourself, what is that person doing that I'm not? And what they took away from that was simplicity, simplicity, and simplicity. So you're 100% right because it, your song is not the star of the commercial. It, it's the three words like gotta have it uh, that are the star. It, it's the star concept and your work is supporting that. Um, yeah. Yeah. If anybody's yeah, saying, wow, that's a great song, then the commercial has missed its mark. They should be going, I got to have that product because your song made them feel that more. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the whole thing. It's it's, And it's usually an action, um, you know, it's that whatever hook you're using, it's I got to have it. It's got to involve some type of action in, in, in most cases. So, um, um I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of some of my hooks. I do what I want. I got a, a, a attitude and swagger, that that kind of thing for advertising. It always, always is good. And yeah, that's. But yeah, it, um, yeah, the high field. Obviously, that your pep talk to them set them on the right path. Well, <laughs> you know, I can only take so much credit. I could give them the information. Some people choose to use what they hear. Some people go, yeah, what does he know? Uh, they were. They took it seriously, and they quickly discovered that by doing that, that they were getting better results. And now they do really, really, really well. And I love them as people, first of all. They're just, um, they're gracious, good-hearted people that are hardworking. And uh, I haven't seen them since, probably since that road rally. Uh -huh. um, but I always, when I talk to Rob, I always ask how, how Nate and Kaylee are doing. And it sounds like they're doing great. They had a kid about... I don't know, very early into COVID. So their kid must be about two years old. So hopefully they're still oh, wow. getting to write some because the two-year-old will definitely be a time suck on that. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. What else can I ask you that I've got on my list? Oh, do you ever feel constrained or do you feel the opposite? Some people say they feel empowered. Other 
people say they feel constrained when they get a brief uh, or a taxi listing and we're looking for this kind of song and here are some references. Do you like that structure or do you find it limiting and constraining? No, it, I, I, actually I love those because sometimes it's a song, well, I mean, gosh, for the last several years that I get the taxi briefs in the morning and I'm hearing songs that I've never heard of before. Um, and it's like, there's different rhythms or different instruments. There's a different way the, the melody is going. And it's like, um, I wouldn't have heard those. I, I mean, you can't hear every song there is, but um, having those specific songs that are in demand. And that's the other thing, you know, that they're in demand because they're coming in a, a, a taxi brief. Um, and as I study those songs, I, I'm learning new, I'm getting new tools, put it that way, that I won't use just for that song or that I'm trying to answer that brief. And sometimes I, I won't be able to come up with something. Uh, a lot of times I won't be able to me. I've picked up some of what, um, what I'm hearing in that song and that goes into the next song. And, and that's the other thing, even if you miss a deadline, you're still writing popular songs that are in demand. And if there's one request for it, there's going to be more. So you're going to be yeah. ready with a top notch song, hopefully for the next go around. But yeah, it's, it's not constraining at all to me. I, I, you can write the other stuff, which I do. I mean, I, I write a lot of different styles and I'm always looking for stuff that I can do, you know, authentically. Um, do you find that you work every day at this? I mean, you know, you don't have another job. This is your full-time job now because you've seen what X amount of time spent can produce X amount of results. So are you, you know, multiplying that times 40, 50, 60 hours a week and looking down the road at, at a full-time income from this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. The 18-year-old is going into pre-med, uh, <clears throat> later this year <laughs> wow so yeah so i i need some placements um <laughs> well yeah. clearly he got the gene pool the the gene pool up here must have come from your wife's side of the family sorry i oh, can only wow. kid i can only kid jp because i know him well no that's that's awesome man congratulations on that uh wow yeah, he, he could he can write a song and he can sing and play guitar too so wow i had my my little influence um yeah, so I, I probably write eight eight hours a day on the weekends. I probably only do four, but yeah, it's. I mean, to me, it's it's like a job. Seven thirty in the morning, I'm down here in this studio. Well, usually, um, I start out on, on the couch upstairs, and in the morning is when I'm most productive. So I'll, I'll just have my acoustic there, and I'll start you know, noodling around or, or whatever it's ideas that have come to me overnight. And usually I'm up two or three times a night with an idea that, that pops into my brain. And I never, even though I want to, I never go back to sleep. I always get up, oh, man. Write, it, write it down because I've had ideas and we've all done it. Songwriters, um, you, you have a melody in the middle of the night and I'll remember in the morning and then you never do because <laughs> I'll get, I'll get up and, and I'll, I'll look at my phone. It's like, I know I had something and I have no idea what that melody is. And then I'll play it. Of course it'll come back, but yeah, I force myself to do that. And, uh, my wife's very accommodating. She's like, yeah, she's used to it after 25 years. So, <laughs> uh, if I can get a little personal and ask about your wife for a moment, uh, have you seen a shift in her attitude as you've started to figure it out and get more stuff signed and get more stuff placed? Has your wife uh, been more supportive? Like, wow, th this thing may actually have some legs. She's always been, I mean, I met her when I was bass player for a big time artist and okay. he's making some pretty good money. And, and then I, we had our first child and it's like, I'm getting off the road, hon, and I'm going to start a wildlife removal company. And she's like, what, <laughs> what is, what is that? So anyway, I started and 
it was successful and I sold it in 2015. Um, and she's always been very supportive as far as she knows something's going on, on up here. It's not all cuckoo. So it, it's like, <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, she, um, anyway, yeah, she, she has, she's been a little bit happier now that actually some placements are coming in and, uh, cause going from the wife of someone that's, you know, playing on TV and, and doing these big gigs to somebody that's doing other things. It, it was a bit of a, a shift, but now it's, I guess it's, might be fun for her to, to, to be able to say that I'm back in the music industry again. <laughs> right. And, oh, th there's John's song on, on that commercial. Pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the industry really loves songs. And personally, I don't get this so much. But the last two to three years, like, you'll see briefs that'll go out. With, they're, we get this request to taxi all the time, looking for songs from real artists. They're looking for that authenticity. And when I ask people, I get BS answers to be completely honest about this. I'll ask people, why is it so important that this is a real artist? Authenticity. Really? Do you think that the audience, I, I, I've heard people sit down and write for sync and they do it really well. And I'm an expert. I think I've got my bona fides in that category, at least that um, I, I hear stuff and I go, I, I would never sit at home as a consumer hearing a TV commercial or a song placed in a TV show and go, oh, that's inauthentic. It doesn't sound like it was done by an actual artist. It sounds like it was done by some dude in a studio with a home studio, a one man band. Um, what do you think about that whole concept? Does it affect you? Does it affect your writing? Do you think it's absolutely necessary? Have you had stuff that got used even though you are not like in some cutesy name band? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I do write under aliases. I'll, I will say that because I like to keep my the genres separate. Right, um, that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and of course when I'm writing I'm writing with two taxi members. Greg Carosa is, is, is one of them. Um, uh, we've written uh, several for a collection. Um, so we're kind of coming up with our own name and, and, but I have other names. And one of my publishers actually made up a name for me. Cause hmm. it's like, wait a minute. What the hell? It was me and, uh, me and another taxi member uh, wrote, wrote a collection and they came up with a, I think they had, forget what the name was but it was a shock <clears throat> um <laughs> i don't know it's i i don't see the difference i mean i don't see the quality difference um of of you know uh of an actual artist to someone that's writing for sync a lot of times now the the difference of course would be the fan base and if you're being able to pull in people that were are going to support the show that the song is used on right or, or buy the product um i can see that or they're touring and and there's that tie in that would be the only thing that i would see um yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Yes, there, there is, um, if it's a band that's got a name and a reputation, it adds a little cachet to the product for which the song is being used. But to take a name like, you know, a made up name like the Squirmy Fish or something and, and make that your band name, I mean, are the people at the ad agencies really that gullible that they would go, oh, yeah, man, this is the Squirmy Fish. Awesome. <laughs> it's like a, I don't get it, but it's a thing. Yeah, and I've heard some publishers, none of mine, but they, they've asked, I mean, you need to build a whole persona oh, yeah. um, and, you know, put down fictitious tour dates. It's like, and I would never do that. It's like, I'm, I'm sorry. This is the internet age. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I hear about that stuff. I'm a little mystified by it when they tell you, you know, go out and get a certain kind of picture. Oh, no, you know, you don't look right for this kind of music. So go out and get a, a photo from uh, iStock Photo or something. But now the band The Squirmy Fish could end up in an ad for, like, you know, dental appliances or something. 
Well, if, if someone wants to look up something similar to that, there's um, one of our publishers, myself and uh, Jim Thacker, who's a taxi member. Um, we have a um, something called Three Sun, and uh, uh, Dave Freeland also is a part of that. But Three Sun, T H R E E S U N. Um, we have a the album cover is me and the, the one um, guitar player on skateboards, and it's caricature, caricatures of us. So that's about <laughs> as close as we ever got to any type. Of, um, and they were just having fun, the publisher, but we didn't. I mean, they just wanted a name for the for the the project, and they just ran with the artwork. It was kind of hilarious. It's funny, Mary and Laird just put in the chat room, Live Bates, B-A-T-E-S. Um, back in the day, Marion, in around 1978, I actually uh, knew a band in Fort Lauderdale called Live Bait, which was very popular, you know, South Florida, Live Bait, man, we'd go fishing with that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I took my grandson's fishing, by the way, to get off topic here for a moment, because I can't go a whole show without getting a little off topic. Uh, I was in Orlando to visit my two grandsons because of COVID. I hadn't, one of them I hadn't seen since he was an infant, uh, and I took them fishing. Boy, oh boy, taking a, a three-year-old and a six-year-old fishing uh, with sharp hooks, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I think I'm going to wait till they're maybe like eight and ten before I try that again. Um, let's see, see if there's anything I haven't covered yet, and then we're going to turn this over to, you know what, let's turn it over to the audience. Wow, it's 5.11 already. Um, if you guys in the chat room have some questions, start popping them in the chat right now, and I will relay them to John. Um, yeah, actually, getting back that last subject about, you know, uh, creating a fictitious band, I called a charade. Yeah, John, what? Okay, what, um, one other thing I was thinking of, uh, the difference between writing for artists and writing for sync, uh, especially film TV, is a lot of times in um, when we're writing for artists, you have to advance the story. So the second verse can't be the same as the first. It, you're not, right. You don't want to just tell. It has to move. There has to be a time frame. It, it has to go somewhere. With, with film TV, a lot of times you can just elaborate on verse one say what you said in verse one and i've never read this anywhere so maybe I'm, i hope i'm not saying something incorrect but that that's kind of what i do a lot of times is elaborate a bit on verse one so you're giving a different take of um of the story of course it's all supporting the hook and the chorus but you don't have to be as specific as or just staying in that it it's got to be something different for verse two where are we going next is that is the phrase in art writing for artists. So, mm -hmm. so you don't have to be that specific in uh, film TV. Right. First of all, the whole song will, it'll be exceedingly rare that a whole song would ever play anywhere but in a montage, which is one of those scenes where there's no dialogue. Somebody looking at somebody dying in a hospital bed and reflecting on the past life they've had with that person the song is going to carry the backstory about how they feel. It's going to fill in for the dialogue. That is one of the few times that you will ever hear a song played in its entirety. Most of the time, they're going to take a section of it because it's apropos for the emotion or the story or the mood of the scene. So you're absolutely right. No point. It's, it's wasted effort to carry the storyline forward. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from... Uh, Robert Martin, and I think Andre Stepanian asked something about it. Um, you you have a reputation as being a guy that masters your, your stuff. You get it mastered or master it. Um, let's see. I'm going to go with Andre's question. Uh, I know you spend the money and send out your songs to be mastered. Do you do it before each submission or after it's been accepted? And what percentage did you master yourself? Uh, hi, Andre. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I, I don't do any of the mastering here whatsoever. I do a rough mix, and that goes to my guy, um, Mick, Mick Nick's Productions down in Australia. He, hmm. does, he does everything for me. And it, it's, it's almost like getting a second set of ears on songs because he'll mix things a little bit differently from way out, the way I'm hearing it. And 
sometimes I'll, I'll have him change it or sometimes I'll run more with what he's going for. Um, that to me is incredibly useful to have somebody getting a different set of ears on. But yeah, uh, for a, 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 if if there was a um, if I was submitting for a brief for taxi, it, it would have to be mastered first. Um, it's now I've started working with libraries that I don't have to master anything anymore. They just want the group stems, and I'll send group stems to them, which is so much nicer. But um, it, but then I don't have control of the final mix, so that that's kind of tough but did that answer the question yeah it did and uh i i'm amazed that there are libraries that will mix everything i mean obviously they're doing it from stem so it's not as hard but um hats off to those libraries because that adds a lot a lot of work and man hours or person hours if you want to be politically correct to their timeline and, and that says something about them striving for quality you know and and they're by them doing that for you they're not saying your mixes suck they're just saying they have a, a sonic signature throughout their library and they want to keep that stuff within a range of, of sim, you know similar yeah absolutely and they do all the cut downs because they know what cut downs they need the 30s and 60s and it, it's just I'm, I'm so happy that they do it so um Here's a question from Sandra Dale. Is there a site like Air Gigs that play the music, piano, guitar, violin, etc.? I write lyrics but don't know music. Uh, I'm going to answer that one because I can make short work of it because we've got very little time left here, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Sandra, there's really not... There are places that do that that aren't all that like, you know, send us your poem. We'll turn it into a song. I wouldn't go to a place like that. If you're a taxi member, I mean, frankly, even if you're not, go on our forum at forums with an S dot taxi dot com. That's forums dot taxi dot com. And go to the collaboration corner and just say, I'm a lyricist. I'm looking for somebody that that uh, uh, writes melody and produces tracks. Maybe you'll find your soulmate and make great music together. So there you yeah. go. Um, here's true. one from Air Gigs does do that, too. Oh, yeah? I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah, okay, you, well, I would trust them to do that le legal or legitimately. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, it, uh, you just have to look for people that do production. You can send in lyrics and they'll write a melody for you and they'll do the backing tracks and everything. But the forums would be, that would be my first choice because you're, you're collaborating with a, a taxi member in, in many cases. And someone who has your best interests um, and and they probably better understand the end use for the music being that they're a taxi member because otherwise you, and this is not a, a slam on air gigs because I, I love them and have tremendous respect for them but you, a person who's creating a melody and a track for you that doesn't understand film and TV or doesn't understand the pitching of music they're just trying to make a pretty piece of music for you and they may accomplish that goal but but great music and right music aren't always the same thing. Um, here's a question from Bill Threlkeld. Hey, Bill, how are you? Uh, John, do you start each song from a DAW template or start with a clean DAW and add instruments as you go? That's a good question. Template, template, template. <laughs> okay. Yeah, always, I've got templates for hip hop. Um, most of it, it, indie rock, uh, just a, uh, each genre. And um, that way my most of my instruments are loaded already and then of course i don't use them all you know in each song but at least i have a starting palette and i just go from there and okay um sandra the siren wants a little clarification on what group stems mean oh yeah so if you've got um so you've got all your instruments you got guitars you got bass a synth bass maybe that's doubling the bass which i always do in the choruses um so that's your bass stem your your bass and your synth bass combined now your drums your drum stem is going to be all your drums obviously the um, kick snare hat um, a lot of times most of your percussion but not hand claps a lot of times they're they're wanting a, a separate stem for hand claps because they pop out of the mix 
but it, and your 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 synth mix is going to have all your synthesizers, the melodic synthesizers, um, and then there'll, sometimes there'll be a pad synth mix or a synth pad mix, which is just your pads, um, and so on and so on. But it's you're combining groups of instruments, all the guitars, you know, the rhythmic guitars, not the leads. You separate the lead instruments, right, um, on their own. You can find a lot of this in um, books like this. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And one of the books I'm the publisher on, that one, uh, hold it right under your chin, kind of. There you go. Shortcuts of Songwriting for Film and TV by Robin Frederick. I didn't ask John to pop that in here today. He already had it ready to go. You can tell everybody if you found it to be useful or not. Um, but yeah, I make a couple of bucks when you buy one those and, and and jason bloom's um under your chin yep there you go <laughs> yeah yep these these all three of these books if you ever looked at them the, 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 my copies they are so dog-eared from just, um just going over stuff and and going back to it especially robin frederick's book it um jeez that that book opened my eyes so is that woman never ceases to amaze me it's like she must remember everything she's ever read or everything she's ever heard and regurgitates it in such an easy to understand way that you, yeah. it's like you feel enlightened when you read her books i, I, I if i had one percent of her skill in, in deconstructing a song and, and just being able to tell people what i've just done it, it, it yeah she's great she's wonderful um, somebody, oh, here it is. Mike Sass wants to know, how do you organize your working projects, your cues, your ideas to final mixes in your computer? Uh, what's your folder organization like? <laughs> Non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, um, so as I was looking at my phone, holding it under my chin. Thank um, you. <laughs> I, I, I have, I have 5,700 voice memos on there the last wow. time I looked. Um, and I don't, my only organization is, is for the songs that are signed. I use composer catalog, Keith O'Brant. Um, that's my main organization. Everything else is in, you know, song books like this that yeah. um, I, I don't do, I don't write on a laptop or a computer because I something about the pen in my hand is so much more personal. But as far as the songs, um, I don't put ideas in folders. It just I, everything I, I I do a project for almost every single song I write. If I get a verse and chorus, I'm going to throw a project in there and you know on my DAW and go from there. Um. I'm looking for other questions. We've still got a few minutes left. Uh, I want to ask you about bass sounds. You're, you're an A-level, probably A-plus level bass player. I mean, uh, world class. Well, you are. Uh, you know, I've heard your work and know the kind of stuff that you've played on and people you've played with. Um, and, uh, oh, I've still got one more song. I didn't play it. But um, the bass sound on the last one was great. How do you get your bass sound in logic uh what do you do you go direct do you go through a cabinet and a mic how do you do it direct direct with no effects i don't even use a compressor um, wow it's it's straight in if you played forever like i <laughs> no i i i've got well it's it's over there it, it's um <laughs> it, it's my favorite bass it's a it's a pv cirrus five string and I think on living in the simulation, um, I'm using a pick, but I'm, I'm muting it, playing up at the bridge. Hmm. Um, and I'm doing a half mute on it. And that's, I mean, you, to me, you, you got to get your tone from your fingers. You, you know, your fingers and, and, and whatever your pick. If I, I never really rely on any outboard stuff. I rarely put a, a compressor on on my bass it just wow 
Yeah, it just, I don't know. I've got to say, I've recorded thousands of bass parts, and I've never not used a compressor. And I've worked with, like, some really great guys, so you must have incredible touch. No, no, no. Let, let, let me see. No, I said I never do, but maybe my mastering <laughs> guy, he's probably going, golly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow. Um, all right. Let's do uh, Greg Carroza, who you work with. Did you hey, guys? Greg. Uh, Carroza was just on last week's show. Uh, he was out here in L.A., so I had him on a Wednesday, a special show on Wednesday. And I had you two guys together on a panel at the Road Rally. Um, did you guys know each other before that, or did you, or did you meet because of the Road Rally? No, yeah, we, we met because of, of doing that, that uh, little uh, spot on the road rally and and since then uh, working with becky kettleston uh, is our third in this group she's the vocalist and songwriter um i'm not writing any lyrics um, wow but anyway it's uh it's it's working out really well and greg greg's great to work with um great ideas and really quick and yeah this this is a fun this this is some top-notch stuff i can't wait it's it's all signed so it's it's going to be fun. It's funny. Becky Kettleson has reported some placements for the member deals section of the newsletter. And I didn't know that you guys were writing with her until Greg mentioned her name the other day. Now you mentioned her name. And she'll send stuff in like my uh, myself and my co-writers. And so I, I wrote back to whoever collects the, the information. Actually, in this case, it was my wife collecting the information. I said, please ask uh, Becky to tell us who her co-writers are by name next time. <laughs> so that's good to know. So now if she doesn't do it, I could just fill it in on the final edit because you guys certainly d deserve credit. Um, Dan Weber, I think I think you've already answered his question. He wants to know direct bass, hardware, amp, amp sim, or all the above. I think he just answered. You just you just plug it in direct right into your um, what kind of mic pre or interface you're using. Uh, Scarlet Focus, yeah, Focusrite Scarlet. Um, what is it? Can't I or something? Yeah, can't go wrong with that. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to go up a little bit, see if I, I think I've got time for one more. <laughs> a lot of Robin Frederick is amazing stuff, so if Robin's watching today, <laughs> you deserve that, Robin. Um, Ken Mesford wants to know, how often do you update the sounds in your templates as sound libraries are always changing? Hmm. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't I don't use a lot of synth. Well, in that last one, uh, simulation, this that song. Um, there are a lot of pads in there, and a lot of those those are contact instruments. And um, boy, I really haven't updated. I'll add to them sometimes, but I usually keep. The sound, you know, the same sounds in there, but add to. But yeah. it's not, it's not like something I'll do on a regular basis. I don't think about, because um, most of my stuff is is based on guitar, um, and the synth kind of stuff is kind of secondary, I guess you could say. <laughs> Carosa just yeah. jumped off a tall building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except, except for that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he, he tear, I don't know what he does to my bass and, and guitars, but I don't even recognize him anymore. <laughs> well, I've still got like a, almost exactly a minute left, and we've probably got about a three-minute song here, actually three minutes and 17 seconds. So I want to finish the show, first of all, by thanking you. Um, you're a great guest, and I couldn't be happier for you. You know, I, I've gotten to know you over the years, really got to know you well. I think during the lockdown, John and I, or two or three times a week, I'd call him because he's actually an expert on coyotes. Uh, and, <laughs> and as you guys who, and gophers, and as you guys know that when we were doing the quarantinis every day of the week, um, I, my yard is getting destroyed by gophers and coyotes still. I had one two nights ago. I was in Orlando looking at my phone. The little dinger went off. Sure enough, there's a coyote at you know 1, 1 a.m. in the backyard. Now they go, out. yeah. Now they go around and they drink from um, the 
the nozzle where the water comes out when my water, you know, when my lawn gets watered and a little water collects around that thing. And they go um, sprinkler head to sprinkler head to sprinkler head, lapping up the water in the backyard. So, yeah. Uh, I would love to have you come and relocate my coyotes. I want everybody to know these coyotes come over a five or six foot wall that surrounds the yep. entire backyard. I saw one one night running down our cul de sac and ran up to the wall and went over it like a gazelle, man. I mean, no net whatsoever, you know. Uh, I mean, it, it was, or all net, I guess you would say. It, it was yeah. graceful and just like a gazelle. And the funny thing is, on the other side of the wall is a sidewalk on kind of a, a main street. And my wife and I, it's not unusual as, for us if we go to a neighbor's for dinner that we'll walk rather than driving just to get out and, you know, smell a little fresh air. Uh, could you imagine you're walking along a sidewalk and all of a sudden a 40-pound coyote comes over the wall like face high? That would scare the crap out of you. Anyway, all right. Um, so, John, thank you for doing this. I'm going to play this thank out. Um, can you tell everybody where they can go check out all your stuff? Yeah, Spotify, John L. Pearson. Spotify, iTunes, anything like that. But put the L in there because there's another John Pearson. So. Well, now that I know that, we can have him taken care of because he couldn't possibly be <laughs> as nice as you are. Anyway, all right, let's let's listen to Room is on Fire. Oh, and this is one of your aliases, Kid Under Glass. That's one of your band names? Yeah. I'm guessing that's the one that you, you didn't come up with by the look on your face or no? Well, that's, that's, that's one that's, of them. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you winced a little when I said it. All right, here we go. This is Room is on Fire. Come on, cooperate, computer.
Great song, great track. People were asking if the vocalist was from Air Gigs, and I said most likely. I'm guessing I was right yep. about that. Great job. Yep. Uh, and, and man, you've totally nailed like that indie sound of like, I'm cool. <laughs> it just reeks of, <laughs> uh, uh, well, it does. It reeks of coolness. It, it doesn't sound, uh, it, it sounds legit for what it is. It sounds totally in that ballpark. So good job on that. Someday I'll play you my my scratch vocal that she <laughs> that she sang to or that she copied for that song. It's I always keep all the scratch vocals. It's hilarious. All right, next time I have you, maybe maybe we'll do a quarantini just to play some of your scratch vocals <laughs> uh, <laughs> with a, no. a small audience of loyalists <laughs> that yeah. that won't take offense. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, congratulations, John, and thank you so much for doing this show. Thank you guys for showing up. If you like today's show, please don't hesitate to hit the like button. And if you're not a regular watcher of this, click the subscribe button and hit the little alert bell so when we go live, you know about it. Um, we will be back next week. We are like 95% sure we're going to be doing a show live from the... Um, why can't I think of it? Uh, guitars, guitars, guitars. Uh, Guitar Center? Uh, no, PRS. Uh, we're going oh, to the, yeah, the PRS private showroom uh, here in LA. We've just got to work out the, the connectivity thing to make sure that works. If all else fails, we're going to go down there and shoot the show and then just hit play and play it that way. But uh, glad you guys could join us. JP, thank you, man. Um, and tell your family, so, sorry to kick them off the internet for 90 <laughs> minutes. All right. And we will see you guys next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Bye, JP. Bye-bye.